the clinic goes, the animal didn't read the textbook. In terms of therapy, we'd like to narrow that statement by saying the animal didn't read the drug formulary. Indeed, you should understand that dosage regimens are often recommended based upon therapy for a relatively small number of animals, usually ones with no significant abnormalities other than those that are being treated. And even in simple cases, an animal may handle or respond to a drug in a manner that puts it at the edges of the bell-shaped distribution curve, as shown here. Why are formulary dosages just an approximation? Because drug companies and regulatory agencies encourage the study of clearly defined cases, usually mature animals suffering from a single condition. So depending upon the therapeutic and safety margin of a certain drug, animals with additional problems or multiple drugs pose a particular problem for the clinician. How can we address this? Simply put, by understanding more about the behavior of the drug of interest in a specific patient, allowing us to individualize therapy. So the clinician has the onerous task of administering a drug into an animal, which is then subject to what we call ADME, that is absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, which we've already described in detail in prior videos, and pharmacodynamics, or the relationship between the drug concentration, and its action. Basically, the only guide to achieving an appropriate clinical response is knowing something about the drug concentration in that individual patient. And as we indicated in our previous discussion of pharmacokinetics, this approach is really only helpful when the plasma drug concentrations are directly correlated with the response of the drug. This brings us to the concept of therapeutic drug monitoring, or TDM which is the measurement of a plasma drug concentration in the individual patient when on therapy. Although during drug development, full pharmacokinetic concentration versus time profiles are developed, this would be prohibitively expensive and invasive in a real patient. So we generally take samples for drug concentration measurement at one or two time points following drug administration. So TDM is a snapshot. As we described before in earlier videos, the fundamental assumption made is that the drug concentrations in the circulation are proportionate to those achieved at the sites of desired action or potential toxicity. Most of our drugs have concentration-dependent effects and are usually described as log-dose versus effect relationships, such as shown here. Adverse side effects are most commonly also describable in a similar sigmoidal relationship. So let's define some terms. The maximal effect of a drug is called Emax. The drug concentration that achieves 50% of Emax, as shown as the inflection point on the sigmoidal curve, is called the effective concentration 50, or EC50. Generally, this is the middle of the therapeutic range between CP, or min, or concentration in the plasma minimum, or the minimal effective concentration of drug based upon clinical experience within a population of patients, and CP max, above which one sees dose-dependent forms of drug toxicity. The challenge to the drug company, and ultimately to the clinician, is to determine the appropriate dosing regimen to achieve maximal efficacy with minimal toxicity. Therefore, the drugs which are recommended for drug therapeutic monitoring or measuring the drug concentration in an individual patient are those with the greatest toxicity potential. That is, they have a narrow therapeutic index. Later on, we'll get to other practical reasons for understanding more about the drug concentrations achieved in an individual patient. The pharmacokinetic behavior of the vast majority of drugs can be described by what is called the one compartment first order elimination model, which we described in the previous pharmacokinetics video. This means that the concentration in blood can be described by a single compartment into which a drug administered intravenously will essentially immediately distribute, meaning that it leaves this compartment and comes to a steady state. In this model, the average volume distribution, or VD, becomes proportionality constant, relating the dosage D administered to the plasma concentration achieved before any drug can be eliminated, sometimes called CP0. 
as well as a proportionality constant for predicting the steady state concentration following a constant rate infusion or multiple doses, as shown in this constant rate infusion curve. A drug's pharmacokinetics is determined by the drug's chemical properties that influence its tendency to move or distribute into tissue or not, and by the processes in the excretory organs that metabolize and excrete the drug. However, it is important to remember that pharmacokinetics measures only what is happening in the blood, and usually only to the parent or unmetabolized compound. And so it's more about the prediction of drug concentrations in blood rather than understanding the actual physiological processes associated with uptake, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. It's important for the clinician to be able to ignore his or her thinking about what specific tissues the drug might be taken up into and simply be satisfied with concluding that the average distribution in tissue is described by the volume distribution and that is usually useful for predicting the plasma drug concentration following the administration of a given dose of that drug. It's also important to be satisfied with an understanding of the parent drug's elimination rate from the plasma that it might be a nebulous combination of its metabolism by the liver and kidney as well as excretion by one or both of those organs. Knowledge of this elimination, after all, is critical to establishing appropriate dosage intervals. Now let's take a look at giving intermittent IV doses to a, of a drug And what this curve shows us is that whenever dosing is intermittent, another question that must be raised is whether the drug concentration at both peak, that is CP max, and trough, CP min, are in the therapeutic range and not in the toxic range. Whether the clinician worries about this or simply worries about the average drug concentration or mean drug concentration, which would be CP max plus CP min over 2, depends on how the drug works. The best examples of this relate to certain antimicrobials. We know, for example, that penicillins and cephalosporins must be maintained above a certain minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, in order to successfully suppress the microbe. So making sure that the peak and trough concentrations are both above the MIC becomes important. However, for drugs like aminoglycosides, which we'll show you in a minute, and fluoroquinolones, the bactericidal activity is mainly associated with the peak concentration, that is CP max, and so dosing strategies focused on higher dosages given less frequently. This leads us to the question, for which drugs is TDM a logical thing to do? Well, there are two general scenarios. The first is when there is not a good clinical way to monitor successful therapy, but success would be predicted by drug concentration. And the second is in scenarios where drug toxicity or lack of efficacy can lead to serious consequences for the patient. And TDM becomes more logical yet when there's a small difference between the therapeutic and toxic concentrations of a drug, that is, a narrow therapeutic index, or unpredictable pharmacokinetics between patients and significant potential for other drugs or concomitant diseases to impact the disposition of the drug of interest. To be more specific, we should seriously consider TDM when we suspect that the owner isn't able or willing to successfully administer the drug as prescribed, any time we change the dosage regimen or move from one drug formulation, for example, a trade name drug to another, that is a generic, or any time a standard dosing regimen has not led to a therapeutic success. After all, you can't blame the drug for not working in a patient if the dosage regimen was inadequate. If it was adequate and the drug didn't work, it was probably time to move to another drug. Other scenarios in which TDM is logical are for drugs that are metabolized by the liver and the hepatic metabolism is possibly enhanced or inhibited, or there are drugs for which plasma protein binding is inhibited by drug-drug interactions. Even without a specific drug metabolism rationale, we also need to suspect that pediatric and geriatric patients, as well as animals with severe illness, particularly of drug metabolizing organs or of the heart, are going to be at risk. Ultimately, it is virtually impossible to confirm a diagnosis of drug toxicosis if we don't know that the drug concentration itself is elevated. Let's now turn to specific diseases associated with specific organs 
that may suggest that a drug's disposition may be altered and therefore lend itself to TDM. An individual patient may have alteration of physiology or pathology which results in a variability of drug concentration greater than that you'd see in an experimental animals. Toxic drugs administered in the following conditions might then be addressed by drug monitoring. For instance, cardiac disease, where you have reduced cardiac output, which reduces organ blood flow, reduced drug binding, and congestive heart failure is another reason. Hepatic disease, reduction in intrinsic clearance of the drug can be due to decreased blood flow, and also there can be a reduction in hepatic drug metabolism. Hypoproteinemia, there's a reduction in drug protein binding. Renal disease, where there's reduced plasma protein binding or an altered volume distribution, or most importantly, as we'll show later, reduced renal clearance of drugs. Pulmonary disease, pH changes can influence tissue distribution and renal clearance. Hypoxia can influence organ blood flow. And finally, thyroid disease. Hypothyroidism often causes reduced drug metabolic rates, while hyperthyroidism may increase them. Now turning to another reason for TDM, it's not uncommon for multiple drugs to be administered simultaneously. When each new drug comes, the increasing likelihood of a drug-drug interaction. And so one that the types of interactions that can be determined by therapeutic drug monitoring include the induction or the inhibition of drug metabolism. For example, drugs that induce cytochrome P450 include phenobarbital, primidone, and phenylbutazone. And drugs that inhibit it include chloramphenicol, quinidine, tetracyclines, and cimetidine. Now let's cut to the chase and list the most common drugs currently being measured via therapeutic drug monitoring in veterinary medicine. And I think you'll see from this list that if you look at the top reasons for monitoring drugs, it includes serious consequences of toxicity, difficult ability to measure the endpoint clinically of the drug uh, efficacy, narrow therapeutic index, variable pharmacokinetics, and the potential for drug interactions. And so the drugs that you'll commonly see being measured via therapeutic drug monitoring in veterinary medicine include antiepileptics, phenobarbital, primidone, where phenobarbital is measured, bromide, levetiracetam, zonisamide, the benzodiazepines. Occasionally you'll see antimicrobials measured. We mentioned and we'll mention aminoglycosides, genomycin and amicacin, immunosuppressants like cyclosporin, cardiac drugs like digoxin, phenytoin, procainamide, and quinidine, and hormones. We often forget that thyroxin, that levothyroxine, is measured in order to both pre prevent the underdosage, but also to prevent toxicity, particularly in large dogs, causing the, the signs of hyperthyroidism. Now just briefly, let's just talk about where and how you get drug concentrations measured. Diagnostic laboratories employ, for the most part, immunological assays like ELISA's or radioamino assay, and included in automated procedures used for chemistries and hormone measurement. Occasionally, but more rarely today, bacterial growth inhibition bioassays may be used for antimicrobials. Chromatographic methods, including liquid and gas chromatography with or without mass spectrometry, might be necessary if drug metabolites need to be determined. Veterinary diagnostic laboratories now offer drug monitoring more commonly, but it can also be requested of human laboratories or hospitals as the drug measurement techniques can be adapted with minor alterations for animals. University laboratories with clinical pharmacology services also support such analyses with interpretive help. So in summary, Drug dosages are originally established in a very small number of healthy animals by drug companies. The response to a drug varies between patients and is often described as an inverted bell-shaped curve. A clinician doesn't know where a specific patient might lie on this curve. Therefore, therapeutic drug monitoring, or TDM, is about individualizing a drug dosage regimen for a patient. TDM is most commonly done for drugs that show significant toxicity or are costly. TDM may be indicated in the young, the old, the infirm, 
and when multiple drugs might be leading to drug-drug interactions that impact drug metabolism or distribution. And when TDM is performed at a time when drug distribution and metabolism is at steady state, dosage adjustments can be proportionate to relative changes in the plasma concentration at steady state.